Okay, so a follow up to the culture and civilization notes. Let's look at a few of the first civilizations. Now, you've gone in depth in this already back in middle school, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time uh, going real in depth. What we'll hit is some key points uh, about these civilizations, specifically the Mesopotamian, the Egyptian, the India, uh, India area, Indus Valley, and Chinese. And later on, we'll talk about the Olmecs and the Incas down the road. But when we get into class, we're going to focus mainly specifically on uh, key important details, like Hammurabi's Code in Mesopotamia, uh, the idea of divine right leadership of the pharaohs in Egypt, um, especially you know, the mandate of heaven in China, and some kind of legal and philosophical ideas that the Chinese had. And of course, with India, mainly focus on their planned cities and eventually into uh, their religion, Hinduism. But we'll get to that at a later point. So let's look at some of the first civilizations and where they're located. The big one you have to know, obviously, is a big first civilization is found in the Middle East, and that is Mesopotamia, specifically in an area called Sumer, which is down at the bottom of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers leading into the Persian Gulf. You know, those rivers are really decimated today, and that's what you know is modern-day Iraq, Kuwait, and Saudi Arabia. So basically, Sumer, uh, specifically looking at the city-states there of Uruk and Ur, when we talk about Hammurabi and the Babylonian control, when we talk about the epic of Gilgamesh, this is the area we're talking about. We're also looking at the Nile, and of course you guys are very familiar with Egyptian culture, the pyramids, the sphinx, all right, the temples. Uh, hieroglyphics, it's all major parts of Egypt that you've learned before. When we look at it, we're going to look specifically at why Egypt was able to prosper uh, versus Mesopotamia, who fought uh, willingly and, and a lot against each other. But you can see the Nile, 4,100 mile long river that flows north into the Mediterranean Sea, and you can see the Nile River Delta here in this northern section. Um, that became very important for trade, and of course Alexandria, when we talk about Alexander the Great, we talk about the Romans and the focus in those areas as well. You also have the Chinese, the Indus Valley, and the Central Asian Oxus. We won't concern ourselves so much with the Central Asian Oxus, we'll, we'll look at where that's located. Of course, if you notice, folks are all on rivers, okay, with the Chinese River Valley, or along the Yellow River. And you can see from that map, if you look a little closer, the different time periods uh, where people kind of expanded out into different parts of the river and the areas that got built up by the silt and the overflow and the flooding of the river. Okay, one thing that's going to make these rivers very significant is if they flood consistently versus if they don't flood consistently. That takes us back to why farming was created in certain areas versus other areas. Okay, so here's the Chinese along the Yellow River, which is their breadbasket of civilization. You also have the Indus Valley. Now, the Indus Valley today sits along the Indus River, which is northwestern India, and today what is modern-day Pakistan, okay? Uh, the groups we're going to focus on will be the Harappan civilization and the Bojahadera, okay? They're going to end up with planned cities, and they're very, they're very interesting civilizations since their writing cannot be deciphered. But this is the area that they're going to be found in, and really where Hinduism and the ideas of the caste system we're going to build from. And lastly, the Oxus. The Oxus is found in Central Asia, uh, northern Afghanistan, Iran. I wouldn't worry about that so much right now. Two other cultures or two other civilizations we need to look at, and we'll look at them more down the road, are the Olmec and the North of Chico. The North of Chico will actually become the Incan civilization. The Olmec are the precursors to the Mayans. You can see in this map here, the Olmec, the Maya, and the Valley of Mexico will be where the Aztec are. Okay, so the Olmec is in this general vicinity of Central America. We'll talk about them a little bit more down the road when we get into um, globalization and exploration. And of course, the North of Chico, which I said will turn into Inca, which is modern day northern or northwestern South America, Peru, Bolivia, in those areas. And again, um, when we get to Cortez and Pizarro and those of the Spanish conquistadors who conquered these areas, we'll focus more on those two civilizations. So, let's look at some characteristics of these first civilizations. First, let's look at Mesopotamia. Our first big thing with Mesopotamia is you have competing city-states. Each individual city-state is going to grow on its own, and what you're going to see there are like, you know, individual chieftains. And again, we talked about this in the last set of notes, that the religion had a major factor, and it became a very patriarchal society. Um, but the competing city-states are going to be competing because, well, when people get hungry, they're angry. All right? And... Along the Tigris and Euphrates River, there was not consistent flooding. So you're going to have these competing city states not just looking for more land and power, which can be a very, very much a human characteristic, but they're also going to look for food, and that's a big part, too, as well. All right, we talked about this earlier, too. It's the earliest written language with cuneiform. When we focus on Hammurabi's code and the Babylonian,
Babylonian king of Hammurabi, what he does when he actually codifies 282 laws that people can actually read and see and know what's going on, it's going to make them a much more stronger uh, civilization. So the early written language, the fact that you can take uh, wedge-shaped writing and put it into stone tablets for everyone to see becomes so critical to the growth of Mesopotamia, specifically the Babylonians, and down the road. All right. We talked about polytheism before. Polytheism, obviously, poly being the prefix for many. Theistic and the, uh, theology is religion. Many gods here. And the chiefs are going to act as intercessions or even as godly type characters. Again, when you have power and you're educated, you can really make people believe what you want them to believe. And you'll see this in Mesopotamia. You'll see this in Egypt. You'll see this in China. You'll see this even down the road when we get to absolute monarchs or Europe. That they believe they are put there by God and in control by God. All right, and, and Hammurabi did serve that purpose. He looked as a true leader of those people. Again, we'll talk about them later, okay? The big issue, going back to the first problem with competing city-states, is this idea of soil erosion. When you over-farm the land, and if you do farm if you've been around farming, you know this, if you over-farm the land, it's going to wear out the nutrients. And after a long time, those nutrients won't be there, your crops won't be grow, your crops can't grow, you can't eat. You can't have sustainable food. One thing we'll talk about down the road is this understanding of that certain types of food crops, barley, wheat, sorghum, they're going to grow along with the Eurasian continent, east to west on the axis of our world. But if your river doesn't flow, it doesn't flow consistently, and you overtill the land or you oversee the land, you're not going to be able to grow food, which is going to lead to putting your emphasis into war. You put your emphasis in the war and try to take other city states, you're going to try to take and get food. Okay, so that's going to be a big thing. And understand about Mesopotamia, we're going to compare Mesopotamia to Egypt. Mesopotamia is violent. The epic of Gilgamesh, it's a lot of darkness and sadness. It talks about the deforestation that has to happen to build walls around their city. It talks about the, the fact that there is no crops to grow. Okay, so that's going to be a big issue down the road with Mesopotamians. And we'll get into that more when we get in class. All right, in Egypt, the big thing is you have a unified territorial state. You have Lower and Upper Egypt. Lower Egypt being the area closer to the Mediterranean, Upper Egypt being the farther down the Nile into what is what is called Kush uh, or Nubia in that area. But because of the Nile being consistent and the ability for it to flow consistently and people to grow their agriculture consistently, what you see is Egyptians not breaking into city-states, but Egyptians calling themselves Egyptians. There's, there's different groups all over the area, but they work together and they'll fall underneath one pharaoh. And the Egypt will la Egyptian kingdom will last for a long time. You'll have an old kingdom, you'll have a middle kingdom, and you'll have a new kingdom. And it'll last for centuries, really up until the fall of Cleopatra. Uh, and the Roman takeover of Egypt, that's really when you see that, that change. But they're going to be unified because of the agriculture. All right, so the people in control of Egypt are called pharaohs, and you're familiar with pharaohs, and you'll see a note down at the bottom here in a second that says, pharaohs as god kings. That's what pharaoh means, okay? That's because they believe they had divine right. It was their gods who placed them in control of others. They were the ones who were born into a certain family because that family was placed there because of gods in, in, in a higher power control. All right, again, they're educated. They're wealthy and they have the power so they can say what they want to say and tell the people they want to tell them and the people will believe that. And if they don't, there's not room for them in their society. Okay? So the powers believe they have a divine right power from God to rule. They get this from Ra or Isis or whoever is giving it to them coming down from the heavens above. Of course, that also goes along with their long-lasting eternal life of mummification and what's going to happen in the afterlife. Uh, a big comparison between Mesopotamia and Egypt is the fact that Mesopotamians believe that their afterlife is like a hell-type society, where Egypt believes their uh, afterlife is heaven-type society. Okay, uh, Irrigation that does not leave salt behind, so you're not going to have a desertification happening along the Nile. Again, agriculture is huge. It's going to grow with the consistency of the Nile. And then lastly, as we mentioned earlier, the pharaoh has a god king. Okay, Moving on to China. First thing with China, you have flood control. The yellow did not flood consistently. The main rivers in China do not. Even today, they have issues with flood control in China. Um, recently, in the last 10 years or so, an entire 
village had been destroyed, they were eva able to evacuate the people because they couldn't control the flood, uh, and that village is no longer there. So the idea of flood control, uh, establishing some type of dam system to allow water to go into the crops in a, in a much more controlled setting, not perfect all the time, but at least able to produce um, a lot of food for the people. All right. You have under the Cho Dynasty what is called the Mandate of Heaven. Now understand the Mandate of Heaven is very similar to a divine right. The difference with the Mandate of Heaven is when an emperor of China is put under this control, if something bad happens, a flood, a disease, some kind of pestilence, some kind of famine, okay, then obviously then the gods are not looking very well upon the emperor and it is believed that they should strip the power from the emperor because of it. If the emperor is doing what they're supposed to do, then the mandate of heaven allows them to continue to be emperor. But if something happens wrong, and normally folks, these are out of their, the emperor's control, but again, it's, if he's appeasing the gods or not, then that power can actually be stripped from him. And that happens under the Cho dynasty of Egypt or China. You have this set up of what is called legalism. Okay, when a man by the name of Chin Chi Huang Dai comes in, and these are some of your other notes that you just have to copy down, you have to listen, he is going to establish a very, very orderly system of government where you have he as the emperor in control, and there are no, like, fighting against him. There are, you don't have a freedom of speech, you don't have the ability to do what you want to do, you have to kind of fall in place, and if you don't, the government gets rid of you. All right, so this legalist mentality is meant to create order. There becomes a bureaucracy that is created in government. Uh, there is under the idea of the Confucian system. Of course, Qi Qi Shuang Dai was not big on Confucianism. We'll talk about Confucianism down the road. But the idea that somebody has to be in power and has to have control. And part of that control for China was you have a very vast and diverse area, a very large country that he had to unify. Okay, with a very strict law system as in legalism is, you know, you're able to unify. The other thing he's going to bring in with, uh, with unification is standardization and continuity. He's going to standardize, standardize the economic system, the money. He's going to standardize weights and measures for trade. He's going to standardize the Chinese alphabet so everyone speaks the same language. He's even going to standardize the size of wheels and axles and roads so that carts for trade can be transported through different provinces of China to make it accessible for trade in the flow of money. That's going to be huge to expand China into a, what would be considered a powerful um, empire at the time. And lastly, we'll talk about the Indus. Okay? The Indus River, you also have standardization. Specifically in the Harappan Valley. The Harappan Valley, which you're going to have what are called planned cities. Okay, They are going to be walled cities, obviously for protection. They are going to place their government and religious buildings in the center of the city. You're going to have streets and avenues as we would know them established. You're going to have some kind of irrigation system set up for your crops. Inside the plants, and you're also going to have a new form of plumbing, which is going to increase lifespans, okay, where they're going to move waste out of the city. This plant city, people knew where things were, and that's going to be huge for the Indus Valley and the Harappan. Now, of course, the Harappans are going to fall off the face of the earth. However, this standardized city is going to make them powerful at the time being. All right, you have irrigating agriculture, which we mentioned earlier, the importance of irrigating agriculture, that you can grow food for your societies. You can have a written language, however, their written language is not deciphered, so we don't know what was going on. We can only figure it out through uh, archaeology and what we studied and what we found. Okay, And you have a caste system. This is the hierarchical system that is created by Hinduism. Obviously, with Hinduism, you have a polytheistic setup, many, many gods. I think, I believe there's over 3,000 different gods in Hinduism. But what happens with the caste system, and I'll post other notes for this, you have a layer, a layer of hierarchy where you have Brahmins at the top who are your priestly class, and you have uh, the poor sutras at the bottom who are your almost not quite your untouchables, they're below that, but they are your peasant class. And understand with Hinduism and karma, which we'll get into later, that if you have good karma and you do what's right, the hope is that you will be reborn into a new society, uh, a new class structure as you go go through your lives until you eventually reach that idea of moksha, which again, we'll get into with Hinduism later, this idea of moksha where you're reaching full uh, awakened and enlightenment. However, with this caste system, it also puts a socioeconomic class structure in place where those who are rich at the top and those who are poor are at the bottom. In our next set, 
we're going to look at Greek and Rome and their civilizations down the road.